Dungeon is a, um, a board game version of the Dungeons and Dragons environment that doesn't need a referee to allow people to be able to understand what a fantasy game is all about. It uh, came out of my experience with uh, being a part of David Arneson's uh, play, uh, play group down in, uh, over in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we struggled with David being the only referee for a fair amount of time. It got to be uh, to a point where um, he would spend like 14 hours on Saturdays trying to do dungeon uh, expeditions with, with all of us. And, and then we finally figured out that during that we didn't need to actually physically be there. We could call him on the phone. <laughs> and so the evenings all of a sudden became uh, filled with, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet. We all were steeped in, in the Tolkien uh, trilogy. And the, if you read this, uh, you know, the, the uh, Gandalf leading them through the caves of Moria, that's a, that's a dungeon crawl of, of a magnificent, you know, uh, proportion. So I would think that, that we would lend ourselves to that descriptiveness. I, and I really do, you know, looking back at it, I, I've read The Lord of the Rings seven times and The Hobbit three times. In, in both of them, you have caves and roaming around in caves, finding treasures in caves. You're just, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet is all over, the, all over those books. Yeah. And so as an, as an inspiration, it wouldn't be, take too much to to go when we, when we make these games. When you get into a fantasy game or a storytelling game, now it just opens it up. What do you want to do? Now we can ask some sort of crazy things. We can say, oh, I'm gonna go over there and pick a flower. Well, that's not that interesting, right? But that still was a possibility, that inanity, we could still do that. But that wasn't there when you had the, the, the way the rules were uh, for a lot of games. You just didn't have that, that richness that, that could be added into it. You can't pick a flower in Monopoly. No, you can't pick a flower in Monopoly, that's right. So, but we could say, I'm gonna plant a garden in, down at the bottom of the, of the hill. I'm gonna buy a house and then start b building your own tunnel down into the, and making your own pathway into it. Arneson allowed that. I bought a house. I was the first thief of the, of the world. What was your thief character's name? Uh, McDuck. I, uh, but McDuck di actually died on the first expedition. So um, he had a, an assistant called Number One, just like on uh, uh, Star Trek, Number One. Well, Number One went on to be one of my longest lived characters. So he was always just Number One. Because <laughs> that, 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 so I've, I've sort of given him the the accolade McDuck, just because of the number one doesn't uh, really convey, right. convey very much. So, so that gives us uh, um, uh, the flavor of, of what Arneson had done. And, and as we expanded on that, as we experimented with it, it became overwhelming to David as to how, how could he cut it down. David Arneson was one of the first play, players of this game. Uh, the, the weekend after I invented it, uh, I took it to the, the Arneson basement um, and, and uh, presented it to the world after we had finished our battle. And, uh, and we all enjoyed it. I mean, David got to play and he didn't, there were, and I was successful. I did, you did not need a referee to play this game. <laughs> So David Arneson finally got to play uh, in a dungeon and that he didn't have to be the referee of. And that was, uh, okay, well, how did I, what, what, what inspired uh, uh, my, me to well, make here's, this dungeon? Here's, here's what I, I'm gonna just tell you what the story I heard is and you tell me what you think of the story. Okay. The story I hear is that if you ask Dave Arneson who invented the dungeon, the concept of going underground and adventuring underground, mm -hmm. he'll point at you and he'll say McGarry did. Ah. And then I was told that if you ask McGarry who invented the dungeon in games, you'll point at Arneson and you'll say, Arneson did it. Yes. 
and, and what do you know? What's the truth to this story? Tell me the truth to who invented the dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons, or dungeon. How did that come about? Um, okay. I, well, how did the, uh, the dungeon come about? Or what's the so truth to that story? Is there any truth to that story? Yeah, I would say that they, both of us would be saying the other guy did it. The other person did it. I mean, it's sort of a, again, this is one of those mutual uh, uh, maturations of, of an idea. David had the idea of using paper and pencil and, you know, drawing tunnels. And, we, and he drew a big map, which we didn't know anything about. And then we were exposed to it by his storytelling. He would say, you're at the mouth of a cave. You'd go into the cave, and then you, you'd go 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, the intersection, you can go left or right or down. And then you uh, expand on that as you get into more fantastical descriptions. And again, the Tolkien description of Mo the caves of Moria are, are, are you know, a, a fantastic understanding of what a dungeon crawls are about. So, you know, it, it's sort of an, an accretion idea. Arneson exposes me to his paper and pencil version. I am looking at Arneson being overwhelmed by being the only referee and that how, how much effort it takes to make a dungeon. And then for some reason it was like, well, let's get rid of the referee. What do I have to do to eliminate the referee out of, the, out of this game? And that that's, was the, the, the spark that drove me to make this game. It was a 72-hour um, extravaganza. Of, uh, I slept uh, in the 72 hours. I slept to, had two four-hour naps, and it just this 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 map just sort of became uh, out of me. This the the um, the uh, first thing that I knew I had to do was to show the entire map. There isn't there is there, there's no way to that. The, uh, I can be there with everybody playing it. So I have to uh, publish my entire map. That's not done by anybody, or at least maybe it is now. Right. But, but back then, this is the very first complete map of a dungeon to be used in, for playing a fantasy game. How does one play this game? Does it have role-playing elements in it, or is it more of a board game? It's a board game. It has the elements that you get to pick a player, but they're archetype players. They're not, you know, um, the, the original game came out with just pawns, you know, plastic pawns, white for wizard, red for superhero. And so you had to use your, your imagination for what your character looked like. But, but then you got the very limited sort of uh, choices beyond that. You know, a wizard could pick three spells. I, I simplified the spelling down to three. Superheroes and wizard uh, and elves. Uh, elves had a, a little bit better chance at secret doors. But you, you picked up things on in the dungeon um, as you played the game that actually help you with the combat. But it was mostly you get to choose where you want to go, and then you knock on doors, you open the doors, you fight the monster, and you get the treasure. And as soon as you get the biggest uh, you know, haul that you need for the type of character you are, you run back to the start and say, I'm the winner. You know, we're not, we're not de dealing with rocket science here. This is a very simplified um, right. uh, dun Dungeons and Dragons sort of idea. It's minimalist. It's minimalist. Because it was made, and I made it for the family market. I, right from the go-get, I said, I, uh, this game, if I eliminate the referee, anybody can play this game. This is my dungeon. Yeah, it just, uh, I started in the middle, and then I said, you know, I went, I went to the different uh, edges, and then I said, well, I want to have, uh, you know, six levels, and then it just sort of evolved out of that. And, you know, I, I sort of built as I went. And, and uh, but I wanted uh, funny, nice areas. I had, there's, there's a calibration that has to go on with, um, 
There's a calibration that has to go on with a, a, how a dungeon uh, operates in terms of the, in order to get that, that four different types of players with four different levels of experience and abilities with four different amounts of treasure that they have to get to be able to win the game. That you build a game that allows every one of those players to have an equal chance. That's, that's, a, that's a really hard nut to, to have cracked. And, I, and I, I'm very proud of the, the, uh, the fact that I, that I could hear people playing over, over the years that it, it's, it's a nicely balanced game. Oh, I won as a wizard. I won as a superhero. I won as a uh, the elf. I mean, I, I, that's, I've, I've not heard, oh, yeah, we got locked on. I've always won as a wizard. I've never won as an elf. Right? Right? You know, those are the, the death knells of a game that's not going to last. I mean, I designed the, the map in terms of the, uh, uh, I cut out the squares, and then I, I placed the squares, and I made the, the terrain. My sister, Patty, um, wanted to be part of it, and so she said, oh, I'm going to draw a little bit of art. <laughs> so she's the one that was responsible for the, in, the interstitial art that, that you find. How in old the, was Patty at this point? Well, she's one year younger than I am, so she's, she's 20. Oh, okay. You know, I'm, I'm, Okay, I'm Ventus in 1972. I was born in 1949. So what am I? I can't do math at this uh, late stage. Okay, it doesn't matter. That's not critical. Right. But we have it on tape now, though. Yes. So we have so our mathematicians. If you go, go to work on it and yes. stuff like that. So we, uh, it's, it's only drawn in, in terms of that, the, that it was drawn by painting, you know, by putting glue on the back of uh, these squares and p placing them down on the map. Okay. Um, See, I so had heard that your sister had helped you with the map, and so I wanted to... Yeah, she my was, sister she helped me... She, she's in, doing the embellishment, yeah. That was, okay. the, that was the only uh, contribution. She had no idea what I was actually doing. I mean, you know, the, the, um, and so I, I just... Uh, uh, allowed her to to be part of it because it was it was actually turning into some interesting thing. You know, it added a it added a dimension to the to the um, and actually gave me some inspiration for for uh, our, our energy because by the time I'm getting to be Sunday night, I'm really exhausted. Tell me about uh, what you went through to get this uh, discovered as a game. Discovered. Well, I mean, you're what not going to. You're going to go to somebody and you're just going to say, I got this new thing and it's called Dungeon. And nobody knows, Dungeons and Dragons hasn't been published yet. No. So who finally actually listens to you? Where, what do you do? Well, my very first attempt at uh, selling, how, how do I, uh, once I've invented my game, how do I go about getting it into the world? Um, the first thing that I did was to write a letter to Parker Brothers and asked them, um, I had just written a, uh, read a book where they, they talked about their policy, but the book was uh, 10 years old, so the, the, where they accepted ideas from the outside world, but 10 years later, they're, they've now clamped down. They don't accept uh, outside submissions unless you have a relationship with them. And um, so I have my, uh, a rejection letter from, can I, do you want me to show it? Yeah. What does it say? Thank you for your inquiry concerning the possibility of submitting an idea to Parker Brothers. We appreciate your willingness to let us inspect your idea as an expression of confidence in us and our ability to produce. But they they had they did a form letter. Um, to the to the extent that uh, that. I think the first one is a form letter. <laughs> uh, there's a first one. Yes. Yeah, so, well, are these uh, all your rejection letters you brought down? Oh no, no. These are these are. Um, well, I I wrote. Uh, I don't have the original letter I wrote to them, uh, but I wrote this one, uh, uh, and then I about six months later I was in Boston and I wrote them another letter because I was in Boston and I said I'll let you look at it again again, and then I got my second rejection letter. Uh -huh. But this one is not a form letter. <laughs> oh, really? This is written, and this is by uh, Dorman, 
who, who was a very famous uh, executive of, of the Parker Brothers uh, okay. family and stuff like that. Um, got a letter from, from uh, an important guy. Oh, yeah. No, it's just... Uh, but, uh, so, uh, that was... What was the date on that letter? So that was in December 28th when I got the rejection letter. Um, before that, sometime earlier in that, that month, uh, Ernest and I went down and saw, uh, to meet Gary Gygax. Um, uh, Ernest and somehow I met, met him through probably going to uh, Gen Con um, down on Lake Geneva. And, and he, was all, he had formed a relationship with, uh, with uh, Gygax. And he was, um, he was, he wanted me to go down and, and meet him. And uh, I had first met Gary Gygax at the, in 1970, before Dungeon. Um, I, I was peddling my very first game, which was called uh, Guerrilla War. It was a, a strategic simulation of the, of, a, of the Vietnam era, but it was abstract. And uh, I, w I went down to Gen Con 3, and everything you make abstract, I'm just going to ask you that. <laughs> um, are you the king of abstraction in game design? To some, maybe I am. I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Most of my games are abstractions. Of, anyway, uh, I'm interrupting. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hear the story. So, um, Arneson's, you know, I'm down there for uh, trying to sell my game. I sold 25 copies. We had only 50 in existence. I didn't realize that selling 25 copies in the basement of the Legion Hall at the at the tail end of the of this closet was a remarkable uh, um, uh, occurrence. That was that was a fantastic convention, but I didn't sell out all my inventory. Naive uh, the person that I was, so I thought we hadn't done done very well. But as part of that convention, Arneson dragged me upstairs and to to, to meet Gygax. And it was one, sort of an awkward moment. I mean, you know, Gygax turns around, you know, he's, he's, he's playing a, a, a 50 millimeter uh, uh, um, 16th century game of some sort. Uh, 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 it's, uh, it's a very large, larger than, a large scale uh, figure oh. game. And there happened to be a break, and so he's, we, we say hello. But then after that, there's nothing. I mean, we have nothing to talk about. We don't know each other. You know, Arneson's our only only contact, and and I, I'm not that impressed. And so either was he, I, you know, Gygax, and Gygax sort of just turned away, and I went back to my table. You know, that was that, but that was the very first time I, I met Gary. The next time I meet Gary is we're going down. David Arneson and I are going down to show off um, our respective games. Arnest is going to show off his version of Blackmore, which had become fairly sophisticated through all the game playing that we've been doing with it. And I was going to show off this. Yeah. So back to you meet Gary Gigax for the second time. Second time would be down on 330 Center Street. And we have this uh, game session uh, in his uh, uh, dining room. And we... Uh, he, and Gary's completely enamored with Dungeon. He, he loved this game. And so he said, I'll help you get it published. And Guide and Games said they would do it, but then uh, uh, that's Don Lowry, and he was up in, in Maine at the time. Uh, but uh, it became quite apparent by the summer in 1973 that Guide and Games was not going to publish this game. The, the, the board, it's... It was very difficult to publish. Yeah. It's very expensive, yeah. and uh, and and he did not have uh, Guide on Games did not have the, uh, the resources to be able to publish this game. Well, that summer I was on going around the United States uh, on the bus. Uh, Greyhound bus had a, a mare pass. You could buy a, a pass for sixty days, and you can go anywhere on the system. Well, I was out in uh, in Boston. And I said, well, I'm going to go up to Maine and get the, game, get the prototype because I didn't want them, you know. So that's when I, 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 took the, I got the prototype back from Guide on Games. And then I carried it around for uh, the, out to California and then back to Minnesota. And then we finally decided that, well, Gary um, 
was wants to try to do something with this, he's going to need the prototype. With I'll just take it down to him. So with my very last part of my ticket that of that, I went down to Lake Geneva again and and left the prototype with him. Well, they sold three thousand copies in one year, which for a twelve dollar and fifty cent game was pretty good, and that's back in the nineteen seventies. So twelve dollars was a lot of fair amount of money. The, um, it, the, when they published in the 19, uh, 1980 edition, they came out with a, a uh, in the rule book that they said they had sold a half a million copies. And that was, and uh, even though the, I'm sure it has sold over a million copies, I'm almost positive. And so, so it's going out into the world. And now with the re-release that that um, the Wizard of the Coast is doing, it's going even further. So, um, when you go out and about, have you ever been in a place and, and spotted kids playing your game and they don't know who you are and you kind of watch? Has anybody ever had that experience? Um, once or twice, but it's not, um, it's not something that I really like to spring on anybody. You know, I, I, I don't say I, you spring on it. I just want to know how you feel when you go outside. Oh, it's really, it's quite pleasing. <laughs> can, you, can, yeah. can you kind of work, or how does it feel to see other people, like kids, playing a game that you wrote a long time ago and, it, and it's your design? Oh, it's, a, it's thrilling. I mean, yeah, you, you have the huge amount of satisfaction for the, to realize that, that a design that you did is being enjoyed. As a game designer, I, I, I'm trying to make an entertainment for people to, to to enjoy, and so when I see them um, uh, playing it f for the third time or the fourth time, or I've heard that well, I've played this game to death. You know, uh, I, I wore my game out. I mean, these are the these are accolades that are uh, 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 warming to the heart, and and keeps the um, creative spirit really uh, the flame will just you know keep going. When you get a feedback, a stroking of a, of, a, of a, it's a very nice feeling.